are watching T Radio V, radio in TV. The Social Action Media Network and T Radio V present Creating Good Work Live with your hosts, Ron Schultz and Greg Franks. Well, hello. I'm Ron Schultz. And I'm Greg Franks. And welcome to Creating Good Work Live. We're real happy to be here with us today. We have a, a really nice show for you. Um, our first guest today is uh, Mary Sue Milliken from the Border Grill. And uh, Mary Sue is the uh, co-owner and co-chef of the Border Grill Restaurants and Trucks. And uh, she's been a, a, an, um, uh, an ambassador for modern Mexican cuisine, as well as a pioneer of world cuisine. Uh, she and her partner, Susan Fenneker, also um, received the um, California Restaurants Association's Lifetime Achievement Award, which was only the third time it had been awarded to women. Yeah. Pretty impressive. And when she was also elected to the, uh, to in 2014, to the Menu Masters Hall of Fame. <laughs> Go for it. That's great, Mary Sue. In her spare time now, Mary Sue has co-authored cookbooks, uh, co-starred in nearly 400 episodes of the Food Network's um, uh, Two Hot Tamales, and co-hosted a radio show for over a decade here in L.A. Um, and she competed in uh, season three of Bravo's Master Chefs, and you came nearly won that nearly. and then donated the $40,000 she got from that to her uh, charity that she's very closely aligned with Share Our Strength which we're going to talk about here um, and uh, on which she's on the board and we're we're just we couldn't be happier to have you here with us today Mary Sue it's great to have you here well it's very yes. exciting nothing I like better than to talk about doing good work <laughs> yeah great <laughs> So the, the Border Grill and its uh, precursors, um, uh, the city precursors, uh, put you and your uh, business partner, Susan Finnegar, on the map. Uh, at what point did you realize that it's more than just feeding people, that you were somehow more deeply involved in the community? Well, you know, when you first start cooking, um, it's pretty consuming. And, you know, I went to chef school in the 70s. There were very few women. And you had to really prove yourself. So it, I think we opened our first restaurant in 81. It probably wasn't until another, maybe 10 years in that I really got the feeling that food was a bigger way for me to affect, there was a bigger way for me to affect my community mm -hmm. through my work with food. I love to teach. Susan and I would teach cooking classes. We'd teach our line cooks. And I love uh, sharing information with, with people. And I'm so passionate about food. Um, you know, it just drives me every day. <laughs> I, I have to get my hands dirty and cook. And, and I think, you know, it's what kind of pulls us all together. That it, it's a really the common thread in all humanity. Right. Was there an influence that, that kind of moved you forward and uh, made it clear you needed to become more involved? Well, I think, um, you know, I didn't come from a family that had a lot. So uh, we weren't um, givers. We might have been receiving some assistance in, in a few of the leaner years. Mm -hmm. But my business partner, Susan Feniger, um, kind of you know, gave me a little bit of a template around how her family was giving back to the community and donating money. And of course, we didn't have anything to donate because we were making barely enough to live. But we could donate our um, services. So, you know, it started to become the norm in Los Angeles in the 80s that you'd get invited to do a, a, a fundraiser for the Kidney Foundation or for Share Our Strength or for, um, you know, a million good causes, you know, arts in the schools or, you know, equality for gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender people or whatever. So we would, we would share our strengths, which is then when I finally met uh, Billy Shore and sat next to him at a dinner party, I was struck with the, 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 the name of the organization, right. Share Our Strength. But it was also kind of connected so much to me because I didn't have money, but I could still make a difference. Great. You know what's amazing about that, when you, as you listen to it and what brought your attention to this initiative, are there other uh, things that were happening in your community and around you that was also 
bringing that stimulus to your thought and desire to participate? Well, I think I've always um, enjoyed, you know, that interaction with the community. And um, it, it touched me in a special way, Share Our Strength, because at the time we were working um, not, not specifically on childhood hunger, but on hunger in general. And I felt that um, it was sort of, it, it touched me more than any kind of medical research or other kinds of issues. It just, it was the one that really made sense to me. My dad, um, you know, lived in, in shelters for a while when I was a teenager. He was, had a bad, you know, had some bad mental problems. And so I think it, it felt to me like I could, I could really, you know, give back to those people who were taking care of him in his time of need. How no, is, okay, go please, ahead. No, please. I, I, uh, you mentioned Billy Shore. Okay, now I, I have to say that Billy Shore is one of my heroes. And... Uh, ever since I, I, I read a book of his called The Cathedral Within, and, and in, which this, in, in which Billy laid out how those of us who are involved in this kind of work have to view ourselves as um, cathedral builders, that it may take five centuries for us to really complete the tasks that we're trying to work on, but that we, it, we're the laying that layer of bricks, that foundation is incredibly important and I, I've just found that Billy has just l always lived up to who he is. And I, I, I'd love you to tell us about working with him and uh, what, it, what it's really like to, to uh, engage with him uh, in an organization like Share Our Strength. Well, you know, I joined uh, at the board. He invited me on the board, and I had never held a board position. I really didn't have any idea what that would be like. And um, I kind of just tried to say, you know, I'm not sure you really – want me <laughs> but he was adamant and um, you know it really appealed to me this is a board of people who are so dynamic and everybody you know pays their own way to go to fly to meetings pays for your own hotel there's we're very very disciplined and we run share our strength just like I run a business mm -hmm. you know we don't there's no excess spending anywhere and um, I think you know what what is so great about the way Share Our Strength works is we, um, we really work to maximize people's strengths. In the early days, I remember um, we got many, many fabulous authors to donate one short story, put together anthologies. We did it three years in a row, and then we would have a book to sell about short stories. Or we had chefs all donate a recipe, and we put a cookbook together. So, you know, there's ways of just creating community wealth that you know he's really brilliant about and he's also very good about pulling together the the right people the influencers who really are connected to um you know the important work of trying to move an organization forward so i've been on the board for 20 years now and oh. i've seen incredible changes in in the our work we've really honed in on childhood hunger and creating a hunger free generation We've, um, the leadership around the table at our board meetings is just so exciting. And for all the, all the time and energy I've spent, I feel like I've gotten tenfold back. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. learning from, from how we, you know, the things we learn for, t for Share Our Strength helps me bring back to my own business mm -hmm. and be a better business person. Yeah. The strength of that organization is so large and so powerful. How far is their reach? How many cities are you engaged in? Well, we are, um, we're all over the country, really. We do uh, this, th we started with chefs, mostly. Um, I think Billy's first letter was to Alice Waters mm -hmm. and asked for <laughs> a, um, her to in get involved in helping end hunger in the United States, where it's really unconscionable that there should be hunger in, in the one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. But um, she immediately wrote a check and said, sent it back and said, tell me what I can do to help. So chefs were the f really, the, the Share Our Strength was built on the foundation of the chefs and their work. And we did, we do Taste of the Nation LA or Taste of the Nation Houston or Taste of the Nation Boston. So those were our first, I think we were in 65 cities. Mm -hmm. and, and those are really great events. But now we've grown to, to have a lot of different kinds of ways to raise money and then a lot of different kinds of ways to affect change like uh, advocating for children and and using um, government funds you know being able to connect the communities with the government money that's 
sitting there in Washington waiting to be it's allocated right. for school breakfast or school lunch or after school programs but they're not getting the money because there's just this one little missing link which is what we try to come yeah. in and help with well we're gonna take a, a short break here but the um, w and we're gonna talk a little bit about why uh, share our strength has been so effective in doing what it's doing and then uh, also get into uh, some of the other things that are of interest to you mm -hmm. and uh, so this has been uh, uh, creating good sp creating good work live and uh, We'll be back in a minute. We'll be right back with more Creating Good Work Live. You are watching T Radio V. Radio in TV. Every night in America, another kid goes Not because she's not smart, not because he doesn't try hard, but because despite all the wealth in this country, their families can't make ends meet. No matter where you live, there are children in your community who are hungry. Right now, those children need someone they can count on. When you donate to support No Kid Hungry, that can be you. Together, let's make sure that no kid goes hungry. Sustainable Law Group is a different type of law firm. Our clients are primarily social enterprises, nonprofits, and green businesses. Our mission is to provide legal counsel that is aligned with our clients' values by providing integrated, sustainable, and comprehensive solutions. We're a full-service law firm assisting with everything from incorporation to day-to-day -day operations. Starting a benefit corporation, cooperative or nonprofit, the attorneys at Sustainable Law Firm are ready to support you in all stages of your business. Find us at www.sustainablelawyer.com. You are watching T Radio V. Radio in TV. Welcome back to Creating Good Work Live on T-Radio V. And we're back. Yes, we are. And let's pick up where we left off. One of the things that we're most intrigued over is the power of the organization and, and what has been, what is the strength of Share Our Strength? What is, what's made it so powerful? Well, I think, um, you know, w Billy's, really an innovator and he is attacking this work in in a new and different way um, a lot of times we go into the communities and we meet with lots of different stakeholders and very often some of the smallest uh, little you know nonprofits that are working in a in a community are the ones that we choose to fund more of because we see that they're doing innovative work they're connecting children with the healthy nutritious food that they need in a new way that is you know brilliant and and so we do take the time to really get into or into communities after um, hurricane katrina we we went to new orleans and and we are still uh, dedicating a lot of our, our our work efforts there to help rebuild and help connect the kids who you know um it suffered through the hurricane and and you know need a little extra so though but i you know it's when you go into the communities and meet the people who are really on the ground doing the work that's where you learn which kind of 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 work is what kind of work is really effective so I mean, we're going to change the this uh direction here a little bit and um and talk a little bit about the whole U.S. food policy. And, we, and we're wondering how the, how the food policy here in the United States has, has shaped the fact that children have gone hungry in America. Well, there are s it's a very complex and complicated food system, as you can imagine. But, um, you know, as a chef, I've been really interested for a long time in um, healthy, affordable food. And it's called almost, you know, food justice. I think that um, what we're a lot of chefs are really working hard and and having their voices heard by the government. We're calling our you know 
our senators, our representatives, and really talking about the kinds of things that we need to have a healthier food system, and that's more um, equitable, really. Food justice, can you expand a little bit on that? Well, I think um, we, we have a system now where f a lot of food is um, very cheap, and, um, and especially the kinds of foods that are very cheap are very unhealthy. High fructose corn syrup, fats, you know, salty manufactured foods, things that are you know cheap to make, like I don't know, snack kind of manuf. I don't want to name any names, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Right. <laughs> Never <laughs> eaten them. But they are they are very you know, and they're almost you could almost mm. say addictive. I right mean, up. sugar sugar in our diets ha has exploded. I think we're like. 75 or 80 percent more sugar is consumed than it was 40 years ago and it's a real problem so the kids whose parents are working two or three jobs and trying to make ends meet and don't have much time they're really stuck in the middle where they kind of have to eat fast food or highly processed foods and so their kids are growing up without the nutrition to grow healthy brains and be able to come to school and have you know pay attention and oftentimes you know obesity is the other side of the co coin from hunger mm -hmm. kids really um, who aren't getting the nu nourishment they they might look like they're not hungry but it's it's they're hungry for the right kind of food right. well are, are city and state legislators working with you to enhance the knowledge base in their in their cities and well, communities absolutely greg that's exactly what i think is we need at first it's about educating and getting a, a bigger base of people educated i mean in my perfect world i want to see a food revolution in this country yeah. <laughs> and i believe that a lot of really amazing chefs are starting down that path um you know tom colicchio is a chef in new york and he is well, he's uh, on Top Chef as a, a judge, but he's done some amazing work um, lobbying and advocating in Washington, D.C. with his, um, his nonprofit. And, and he's d done a great job of pulling a lot of chefs together. I mean, we kind of enjoy this, this kind of rock stardom, <laughs> which came out of the blue for me because I didn't expect that. But, um, but we have an, that with that comes a responsibility to help form a, be, a, a, a safer, better, more just food system. And I think that um, our food system in this country could use a lot of help. So, so what do we as a, as a food consuming nation and often a very bad food conserving nation, what do we need to know about our eating habits that we can really make a difference? Well, one thing I worry about a lot is, um, you know, population we're growing at enormous rates as far as global populations go. And I think that um, the, the American diet is one that is not sustainable. It's, it, we can't, everyone on this globe cannot eat the amount of uh, protein, basically, meats and poultry and fish that the American diet has come, become you know, heavily reliant on. We can eat some. But um, I believe that an 80-20 mix, 80% plant-based foods and 20% of the proteins would be a way that we could go forward. And I think people need to get used to eating more vegetables. It's better for them. It's better for their waistlines. It's better for the planet. And it's a, it's a sustainable system where everybody on the, on the planet can share in food. You know, uh, I think 30 or 40% of greenhouse gases are released from our livestock. And, uh, you know, climate change is real, and it's happening, and we have to, that's one way of making a difference. Right. But I think, you know, so working on your own diet, I think, would be one place to, to get started. Oh, and she looks at me when she says that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I didn't look at you. <laughs> well, I have a question. Yes. How can we bring a support base out to help you? With the folks here in Southern California, if they want to engage in and uh, share our strength, how do we get them involved? Well, visitingstrength.org would okay. be the first step. There are, there are lots of ways to get involved. You can uh, hold a bake sale, you can come to an event and support. You can uh, support your favorite chef who's, we're riding 300 miles in three days on bikes, bicycles called Chef Cycle. I'll be doing that at the end of June. I would love any support I could get. 100% goes straight into this fight for children, for 
them to get the, the enough nutritious food to grow and thrive and learn and, mm -hmm. and be productive. Um, there are other ways too. I mean, I think getting involved in, uh, you know, the work that Share Our Strength does, uh, there's lots of ways on the website to get involved, but also in your, you know, creating school gardens in, in your community. I think at different points in your life, you have, you have more time and less time. So, I, you know, I think depending on where, you're, where you are, if you have young kids, you might go to school. I remember when my kids were young, I was at school all the time, you know, trying to figure out ways to make food something that they were learning God, about. what a cafeteria mom to have, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> but, you know, kids, I, th I think getting kids excited about food and, and understanding the difference in their choices between, right. you know, high fructose corn syrup sodas that are, you know, 50 ounces and maybe, you know, water right. <laughs> or milk. So so in the couple of minutes we have left, Mary Sue, wh what's next? Where do, you, where do you see yourself moving toward Oh, I, I, um, I'm working a lot on these food issues in every way that I can. I, I was very flattered to be uh, invited by the State Department to work on the, cul the Chef's Culinary Corps and go around the world to different um, communities and build diplomacy through food. And I think um, my first experience with that was in Pakistan, which was really interesting two years ago. I've also been to Naples, and I'm going to go back to Sicily this year. Um, I don't have time to do it a lot, but I think that reaching out as a chef and working with uh, other chefs around the globe on you know, sustainable seafood and, and meats and poultry raised sustainably and without overuse of antibiotics, which creates these strains of bacteria that right. are unfightable. So, I mean, I think there's just, um, I think for me, it's sort of connecting with my chef community and, and helping us grow a food revolution. You know, Jamie Oliver in, in uh, the UK has done some great work. So, and we all kind of know each other. I think for me, I want to spend my, my next 30 years <laughs> <laughs> working uh, to bring together the food community in a more global way and, you know, fight for food justice. That's great. Well, Beautiful. we really appreciate you coming here today, Mary Sue. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you. And uh, as, as we said at the top of the show, Mary Sue is the co-chef and co-owner of the Border Grill. There's uh, grills, plural, right. and gr Border Grill trucks. There's uh, the in Santa Monica, in downtown LA, in Las Vegas. Right. I've been to them all. They're, Have you? Uh, yeah, they, Good. <laughs> and they're wonderful. Good. Well, yeah, and I, if anyone, would, if you come to visit the restaurants, be sure and ask if I'm there because I'd, if you're interested in this work, I'd love to come to yeah. your table and chit chat well. a bit about, about you know how we can better serve our communities. Well, we we couldn't be more pleased with having you here today and and sharing this work about share our strength because, you know, to me, as I said, Billy Shore is this, a remarkable I fellow. And the work that he's doing to, to end childhood hunger in America is really extraordinary. And the fact that you're on board with it, it just is, is really wonderful. Yeah, it's, yeah. Been a, it's been a real, you know, like I said, for me, it's been one of the biggest pleasures of yeah. my career was to, to serve on that board and to help, um, you know, get deeply involved in the community. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Mary Sue. Thank you. And Thank you. We're going to be right back, and our, our guest in the second half is going to be Mandar Apti, who is the co-founder of Meteorize. There's more to come on Creating Good Work Live. You are watching T Radio V, radio in TV. Most anti-bullying efforts rely heavily on bystanders to take action, leaving your child with no protection. The No App aims to change that. Now your child can summon the assistance of a policewoman to tell the bully no 
and you get alerted in real time with a map of your child's location. With video evidence, the bully's parents can be confronted and school officials can be forced to take action. You get increased peace of mind and your child gets increased self-confidence. Navigating sex in college is confusing enough. Now new standards are demanding affirmative consent and no means no has become only yes means yes. Sounds simple enough until you're asked to explain it. The problem is the word consent, which is about permission for something to be done to you. But we're talking about sex, which you do with someone else, not to someone else. Consent is just the wrong word. It's about mutual license and mutual respect. Watching T Radio B, radio in TV. And now, here's Ron and Greg. And uh, we're back. And welcome back. Mary Sue was really something, wasn't she? Yes, she was. All right. And we're going to go on to our, our next uh, interview today is uh, with a really wonderful man who I met a number of years ago in, on, a, on a train going to Ox, Oxford, England. His name is Mandar Apti, and, and Mandar is a, an award-winning social entrepreneur recognized with the prestigious Ashoka League of Entrepreneurs Award. Uh, he designed and delivered a leadership program using meditation practice for over 2,000 colleagues at Shell Oil Company uh, to foster innovation at Shell. Um, and up until March of this year, uh, he managed Shell's Game Changer program on social innovation. Uh, and, and through this, his investments that they were making, this portfolio of investments, uh, Mandar strived to really showcase businesses that can and must play a greater role beyond philanthropy to enable and scale uh, social impact. Uh, he's the co-founder of uh, Media Rise, uh, a not-for-profit social enterprise with a mission to inspire the creation and consumption of meaningful media to accelerate social change. Um, Mondar is also a senior faculty member of meditation and leadership programs for the Art of Living Foundation and the International Association for Human Values. He's definitely creating good work in the world, and we're really glad he's with us today. Thanks, Mondar. Thank you. Well, tell us about your program and the motivation that has brought it to the public. So Media Rise, like Ron introduced, is a nonprofit social alliance yes. of creatives who want to use the power of their creativity and storytelling mm -hmm. uh, to amplify stories that need to be shared with the world. I have two co-founders uh, that started this initiative with me. Um, my personal drive behind it was uh, when I was teaching in an African-American school um, meditation and leadership practice. <laughs> a sixth grade boy comes to me and says, I've been looking for this program all my life. So I got pretty close to this school in the third ward in Houston. And yeah, when you get close to, you know, young, young hearts and minds, you want to do more than just teach them yoga meditation in the school. So I quickly realized that these people are addicted to their phones and their music. And the thought in my head was, what else can I do uh, to get them access to good content? And so one thing led to the other, and I felt like uh, stories that uh, you know need to be amplified are not getting the word out. Because the person leading a social cause doesn't know how to tell their story very well. Uh, whereas there are these creatives, people who are storytellers, using different forms of storytelling, uh, if I can match them with uh, causes, then they could do projects for each other. So that was the personal reasoning behind forming this alliance. And then as I was working on it, I slowly started realizing that I am also addicted to media. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'll touch my phone and see if there are any emails or people want to talk to me. And uh, th this is a society where we uh, live where we are addicted to media and we are bombarded with media. 
so it's consuming our hearts and minds it's shaping our opinions judgments creating biases so i felt a personal need for creating something where i myself would be able to learn of how media is being used for creating trust and community building and civic engagement so started out with a cause to help the kids in the school but then personally got uh, involved in it uh, and we have done three years of uh, this type of uh, activity festival we do a festival every year yeah how how many people have uh, attended the festival so far or so or or each, or each year about 600 to 700 people attend this festival it's a week long festival in mm -hmm. washington dc it's a curated festival so there are events that uh, have been tactically chosen to bring together certain types of communities and certain types of discussions uh, and the speakers and the moderators of the festival are people that we have chosen who have you know constantly shown that good media can be produced so that they are pioneers they are challenging the paradigm that only negativity sells mm -hmm. so they become the thought leaders of this movement and another reason that uh, you know i feel passionate about this is somebody who is breaking the paradigm needs to get appreciated uh, in all forms of life i think in all aspects of life so media rise we f we definitely strive to pe to put people on the speakers list or moderating a workshop who have shown that you know they they can uh, make good content and people are out there who are consuming that good content so mm -hmm. it becomes an inspiration to many including me yeah. did you have any uh, any things going on during the uh, event uh, where they were making films or they were making content uh, wasn't there a, a, some sort of a uh, yeah a, a short order cook <laughs> so it's a, it's a pl uh, it's a medley of 10 events uh -huh. uh, there are workshops on certain types of storytelling for certain types of causes mm -hmm. We do film screenings relevant to that cause. Uh, we have a pitch night, so we attract uh, good media storytelling ideas, and we ask entrepreneurs to pitch those ideas. And the community then votes for the best idea, and then we get sponsorships. So that becomes another event by itself. And then we choose about five nonprofits in Washington D.C. that are doing good work, but don't know how to tell their story. They don't have a video. They don't have a website. Mm -hmm. So within a day, uh, filmmakers can uh, self-assemble themselves and work with this nonprofit and make a video, a five-minute video, which again it's a documentary-style video. The community then votes on the last day, mm -hmm. becomes a celebrative, uh, appreciative event where somebody has donated their time and skills to help a cause that needs to, you know, have some material to raise funding to spread their word etc etc so media has yeah. becomes a gathering of all types of events uh, there is another very beautiful event we do which is around media literacy mm -hmm. so we go into schools so last year we went to a school and we bring teachers and students and we educate them on how to use this toy uh-huh uh, kids are addicted to media everybody has this toy these days so we teach them how to use this device to make documentaries cool. and we channel their energy to teaching them how to use their cell phone to capture moments and uh, it becomes uh, i would say a very enriching activity for both the students and the teachers who are also struggling on how to keep their students engaged right uh, so that's a uh, field of media literacy that i also stumbled upon and that's what we added to this festival as well so it becomes a creative gathering of uh, four types of groups, uh, Ron. Mm -hmm. uh, person who is a good storyteller, so different forms of storytelling, music, dance, video, film, blogging. Mm -hmm. Second type of uh, category of person that attends is a cause-related activist. Somebody who has a powerful cause, ambition, but is now looking for help for storytelling. Parents and teachers and youngsters themselves. Who uh, So this is a, a unique gathering of these four types of groups. Right, great. Was there any program or, or, or story that you found captivating and became involved with yourself? Um, during the festival? Yes. During the festival, uh, you know, every year we choose three or four domains. Right. Uh, and then the whole year is spent curating that domain. So I come from the energy sector. 
So one domain that we have always had is uh, how media can be used for improving communications about sustainable development, climate change. Mm. Uh, and I remember one of the films we screened was Chasing Ice. It's the story of how a documentary filmmaker puts cameras on the glaciers that are melting. And uh, through that visual stimulation, he, he, he showed how the, um, that, uh, how the ice caps are melting and that visual stimulation leaves you, uh, le left me moved hmm. because, uh, you know, we can crank any equation, we can have a debate whether climate change is happening or not, but uh, visual storytelling for me was very profound. And uh, that I would say is the most, uh, not that anything else that I've seen is, is not up to par, but because I come from this industry that, uh, you know, is uh, you typically <laughs> accounted for, yeah. that was a moving experience for me, is uh, uh, you wake up and you watch this film. Hmm. And again, how many years have you been engaged in this project? Media Rise, we started uh, three and a half years ago. So I conceived it, I found my co-founders, and we have done one festival every year for the last three years. So, Mandar, tell us, you've been doing this now for three years. Give us a sense of uh, what your vision is for moving forward. Um, that's a good question. Uh, three years, I think it has shown me that uh, there are people in the media who care about their own uh, skill and how it can be used for making a better world. So that gives me hope that, okay, there are people in the media that uh, they care about the society, they care about the planet. So uh, from my experience at Shell, I think these people who want to perhaps change media from within, uh, we need to uh, give them special care and attention. You can call them intrapreneurs, just like I was an intrapreneur. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the process of designing a media intrapreneur lab where we bring these change agents from different companies and we help them with different leadership skills of how to navigate complexity in their organizations and innovation skills on how and what they can do using the power of their brand to create, I would say, both social change and value for the brand. So that's the project that I'm going to, I would say, work on now. Okay. It's the uh, Entrepreneur Innovation Lab. We're, we're, we need to take a break here, Mondar. But uh, when we come back, I want you to tell us about this uh, documentary video that you're making <laughs> yeah. and uh, hear a little bit more about the, the work and how this, is, how this is transitioned from Media Rise to, uh, into this new area. Thank you. Yes. Good work live on T Radio V. You are watching T Radio V. Radio in TV. Surviving an assault is never easy, and the questions which follow only add to the trauma. Most victims are not ready to talk right away. With the I've Been Violated app, survivors can confidentially record their story simply by talking on their phone. The record they create is doubly encrypted and stored securely offline, accessible only through the proper authorities. The I've Been Violated app help proves survivors' credibility when they are ready to seek the help they need. Thank you. 
You are watching T Radio V, radio in TV. We're back with Ron and Greg. Well, we're back. Yes. And we're back with our guest, Mandar Apti. Uh, and Mandar, I'm really interested in, in hearing more about this new film venture of yours. Uh, wh what do you want to accomplish with this doc documentary you're producing? I never expected to become a content creator and a content producer. Uh, when I started Media Rise, I uh, struck upon an idea on, um, I would say, two months from two months ago, and the, 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 the vision was uh, looking at the growing, I would say, uh, violence and prejudice uh, against race, r religion, sexual preference, all these things that are happening and that we have curated those discussions over the last three years. Uh, the idea that came in my head was there was a preacher here in this country, Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I have read about him in history books when I was growing up in India. Mm -hmm. And I know that he came to India to study the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi uh, and returned back with the force and the commitment to use nonviolence for social change. Mm -hmm. So the idea I had was um, if I can take some people here in the U.S. who have gone through some sort of violence on both sides of the gun, and if I can take them on a pilgrimage to India, mm -hmm. uh, where they learn meditation practice, where they uh, are part of this huge festival that happened in India last month, where 3.5 million people came together from 150 countries. And if they can see the life in India, will they have the same experience that MLK had? Mm -hmm. So what will their eyeballs see, feel? And will that create healing and transformation? And can I document their experience before, during, and after this journey? And that vision came in my, my uh, mind two months ago. And uh, I reached out to my Media Rise community. And I started asking, hey, do you, have you, do you know anybody who has gone through violence? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we have had many discussions on, you know, hashtag Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So very quickly in 10 days, I was surprised that I spoke to about 30 to 40 individuals who have personally suffered from acts of violence. So these are kids who have been shot by police. These are, you know, mothers who have lost their kids in schools through gun violence, mental health. Uh, I've spoken spoken to some gang leaders, and finally, within 10-15 days, I was able to find this eclectic group of uh, a single parent from Sandy Hook, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of Black Lives Matter activists from Oakland, uh, gang leader from South Central Los Angeles, hmm. uh, school principal from Newark, New Jersey, and I arranged for them to come to India. I raised funding. I uh, brought a crew from Bollywood. <laughs> and uh, we did 10 days in India, different parts of India. Uh, Rishikesh, we then uh, went to the river Ganges. We went to Agra, saw the Taj Mahal. Uh, all this happened March 20th, they came back. And now I'm on the search of editing this film and creating a campaign around this film on nonviolence. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, you know, giving uh, it, it should serve as a communication tool, education tool mm -hmm. um, that should bring back the Martin Luther King legacy, which I feel we have lost it a bit. Mm. I'm just overwhelmed by what you've accomplished <laughs> and what you're doing. It's. Uh, the kids, uh, tell us some of the stories of the children and their responses uh, who were a part of the pilgrimage with you. Well, they weren't children so much as, you know. They I've were all adults. They were all adults. They were all adults. Uh, I can speak about uh, the experience of uh, Jason, mm -hmm. who I met yesterday. He's uh, now 28. Uh, he volunteers his time and uh, writes spoken, spoken word poetry for an organization here in LA called Street Poets. And he also is a farmer, so he's very involved in organic farming. 
but he was a gang leader he went into this uh, i would say dark alley at the age of 14 and uh, he came out at the age of i think 24 so last 4 years he has been he has he has two kids so that perhaps was a reason why he wanted to get out of that world yes. and getting out of that world is not also very easy so uh, he has uh, yeah shared some personal stories with me during the trip in india of uh, gangs and how it is for a, a juvenile to be in associated with drugs and violence and the healing story of his transformation i cannot forget because he immersed himself in india on the second day it was as if he's indian people were talking to him as if he was from india and uh, at this uh, world culture festival where there were 3.5 million people in one place uh, he was like a child trying to find his childhood i would say that uh, i'm sure you know he must have lost somewhere down the road so yesterday we had dinner together mm -hmm. and he was very grateful uh, in fact i remember he kissed me on the way back on the cheek of course mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that he said uh, he wouldn't have ever imagined coming from south central la to the taj mahal and taking a dip in the ganges and he's so taken by the silence, the meditation practice, and the peace activists that showed up from all over the world, that he wants to bring back that change within his community. Uh, and so these are, I would say, and then the, uh, the other uh, profound change that I felt was with uh, Scarlett Lewis. Scarlett was, uh, is a single parent from Sandy Hook. Uh, she lost her son, younger son, to uh, the violent massacre that happened in the school. Um, so during the trip, uh, we got to know each other. We traveled 10 days together. And uh, last week, I've been on the road. So I visited Sandy Hook. I was asking her family members, Do, have you seen any change in Scarlet? And I remember her brother, her younger brother, telling me on camera that... Uh, he has not seen her so joyful after she has returned. So I feel like the objective of the trip is met. Yeah. And I'm very happy and very grateful that all these people came, gave their trust to me. Uh, and we need to, yeah, we need to bring back that, uh, that non-violence approach. Um, Bandya, we're, we're, we're coming to the end here, yeah. but I want to know, why is this such a relevant topic for America? I'm, I'm, you've got a minute <laughs> to talk about the relevance. I don't know if you can do it, but please. So when I came here 20 years ago for grad school, uh, that's not the America I see today. Mm. And I feel that uh, I owe something back to this country, which has given me so much mm. uh, exposure, freedom, independence, uh, that I feel that uh, you know, this is an era of interdependence. And that happens when you build c trust and uh, love. And it has to come from an inner inner perspective of nonviolence. So this film, I think, is just one of several things that need to be done right. to, I would say, bring about maybe a spiritual awakening that we are one world family. We are one human race. Well, I think that we're going to have to leave it at that. And what a great yeah, note to yeah, leave it absolutely. on. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, Mandar Apti, thank you for being with us today. It's, uh, it's great to have you on Creating Good Work Live. And, uh, and thank you all for joining us today. We uh, look forward to seeing you at 4 p.m. On, on Wednesdays for uh, more Creating Good Work Live. Creating Good Work Live is a production of the Social Action Media Network on T-Radio-V. You are watching T-Radio-V. Radio and TV.